Christians today. And, you know, it's kind of funny to ask a question like that at a, at a Bible conference because most of us in this room are going to assume that the Bible can make sense, right? I mean, because if, if it didn't make sense, then we probably shouldn't be here. Or we're, we're wasting our time and money, right? But if we went outside and went across the street and talked to people at the mall, we might get a different consensus as far as um, what, the, what the general take is on whether or not it can make sense. So again, that's the, that's the question is, can the Bible make sense today? But really, again, the, the golden um, answer to that is yes and no. So it's, it's really, it, it's one of those things, it depends on who's asking the question. Can the Bible make sense? If it's a saved person, then can the Bible make sense? Absolutely, it can make sense. If a lost person is asking that question, then really the answer is probably not so much. It's probably going to make a little less sense to somebody somebody who's lost. It depends on um, what their heart attitude is toward the book. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We'll, we'll begin there. Acts chapter 8, as you're turning there, as he had just mentioned, we're the Fox River Bible Church up the street. We're geographically the closest church to this conference. So if you're, if you're out here in the far western Chicagoland suburbs and um, you want to come visit us sometime, again, we're probably maybe five or six miles up the road, Fox River Bible Church. Um, Acts chapter 8, we'll begin in verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So this guy is a proselyte. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, he read Isaiah, the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, and here's the, here's the hundred thousand dollar question, understandest thou what thou readest? And again, that's the, that's, the, that's the question at hand is when we see somebody, whether it's in a Starbucks today, you can go up to somebody who's reading the Bible or do, are, are you making sense of um, what you're reading? And again, that's the, that's the big question is, does the Bible make sense? So what we'll say here is that there are, again, it's going to depend on a couple of conditions that we have to meet. So really there, there are four, we'll, we'll say prerequisites or essentials or criteria that you have to have in place really first in order for the scriptures to make sense. And these are things, again, that are going to really have to have to be in place in order for um, God's word to make sense. We read, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's Hebrews chapter 11. So when, when we approach the book, we have to approach the book with an attitude of faith. The, th the second thing that we have to have in place, or the second prerequisite, is that you have to have a teacher. So when we're going to go back into that um, passage there in, in the book of Acts, that's, again, the, the answer that that Ethiopian says to Philip. He says, how can, how can I understand this unless some guy is going to come along and, and teach me about this stuff? The third thing that we have to have in place is we've got to study. So God doesn't just come along and dump the information into our head. You have to actually have to roll up our sleeves and open up the book and study the book. And then the fourth thing, and this is really a critical component, obviously, is God's word needs to be rightly divided. So you have to have all four of these things in order for the scriptures to make um, any sense. So what we'll, what we'll really, again, we'll start with is this, this issue um, of faith. So, with, again, what we want to really emphasize here is with these critical components here is that without faith... The Bible is a complete book of nonsense. Without a teacher as a guide, the Bible is a path that leads nowhere. 
without study, the Bible is a puzzle that cannot be solved. And without right division as the key, the Bible is a locked safe that's not going to open up. So again, we have to have all these things in place. Now, again, that, that first issue is this issue of, of faith as, this, as, the, as we'll say the first um, prerequisite. Now, one of the things that makes this book different than any other book in the library is this is the only book in the library that has the ability to read you back. So there's no other, there's no other book like it. So the way that the book works is that first you have to have faith, and then God responds to you according to the faith that you approach the book. Now, that is a complete enigma to a lost person. It makes no sense whatsoever. So to a lost person, they think, what, what, what book can, can actually read me back? No, no book has the ability to do that. So it, my mind, my intellect is the thing that's going to determine how much I can understand this thing. So, again, it's a, it's a completely, it's a, it's a contrary, unbelievable truth is, is the fact that there's, a, there's an element of faith that's involved with that. So, um, show of hands, how many people in the room have ever ridden a bicycle? Okay, just, just about everybody, right? Okay, now that's a perfect example of something like that where before you got on that bike, did you know how to ride the bike? No, but you had to have some element of faith to get on the bike to begin with, right? If you didn't have any faith, then you would have never gone on unless your mom or dad duct taped you to the bike, which hopefully they didn't. But you had to have some element of faith, right, to get on the thing. And then as you rode the thing and you learned how to do it, the faith just grew, so now, now you get to the point where you get on a bike, and you're not even thinking about it. You just jump on the bike. You're not, you're not thinking that you're going to naturally fall off the thing because the faith has grown. Well, as you get into God's Word, God's Word does the same thing. So as you have to have a little bit of an element of faith just to, just to go down that path. And then as we, as we learn and glean some things, the faith just grows and grows and grows. And again, that's how the thing is going to naturally work. Now, what we're not talking about here. And, and some critics might say something like this, is we're not talking about just blind faith. So we're not, we're not talking about just stupidity or something like that. Um, you know that they took the word gullible out of the dictionary. So you might want to look that up. Um, <laughs> so, again, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about being gullible or, or just blind faith or something like that. We're talking about an, an intelligent understanding of things. We're talking about an open-minded attitude about the single most influential book in human history, period, bar none. We're talking about having a heart attitude of a student, saying, God, you speak, I'll listen, and knowing that this is a book that has spiritual truth and that we can learn some spiritual things about the way that life works and about the universe and about life after death. So, again, we have, we have that attitude about that thing. Now, again, as, as we had just said, that's something that really is contrary to man's logic. So man's logic says, that's not the way that things work. My, I, my understanding on something is based on my level of intelligence. So if I'm s smarter than the guy next to me, then I'm going to understand more about this book or that book, and it's going to be based on what it is that I know. Again, that's going to be um, just the, the thinking of a natural man. Now, God does actually use intelligence. So we'll, we'll say that there are, there are different levels of intelligence. There's different levels of intelligence in this room. So there are, God, what he's going to do is he's going to take the level of intelligence that he's gifted you with, match that up with the faith that you're approaching the book with, and that's really going to be the formula that the, the thing is going to work on. So it's not that your intellect is thrown out with the bathwater, but again, you have, to, you have to have both of those elements in order for the thing to make sense. Now, what the problem was with a lot of, quote-unquote, intelligent individuals is they throw out that element of faith and they want to approach the book just based on their own wisdom. Not going to work. Not going to work. And again, that's, that's, a, that's a complete contrast to the way that a natural man is going to think. Now, so again, the, uh, the issue of faith there is, is a very um, critical component. Now... Second thing we need to have in place is you need to have teachers. We, we say that as a, as a plural. You need to have teachers. 
And anybody here, another show of hands, anybody in this room, have you ever been, it doesn't matter if you have one, but have you ever been a teenager? <laughs> Who's been a teenager at some point? Okay. Has anybody ever been in like a point in their life, maybe when they were a teenager or a young person, where you knew everything there was to know? <laughs> Wasn't that awesome? Nobody had any, no, nobody could teach you anything because you already knew everything, right? So that was a good, good place to be. So you have to have a heart attitude of, of knowing that, that you can be taught, that there, there are still some things out there in the world that you don't know, and, that, and sometimes you, the, the older we get, the more we realize that we don't know, and that you have to be willing to have a teacher. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we really can't touch on this subject without going to this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Again, this is a spiritual book, and it is spiritually discerned. The first teacher that you need to have is God, God himself. The author of the book needs to actually teach you some things that are in the book. So we'll begin here. We'll begin here in verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Here it is, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak not in the words of man's wisdom teacheth, but which, here it is, the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So that's the, that's the issue at hand again, is how on earth, Ed just gave a really wonderful um, presentation just on the, on the witness of the stars and the creation itself. But how can I really know anything about God unless he actually put the information in a book and he would re reveal that information to me? I need him to actually teach me some things. Now, when we, when we go back there, again, for, for, for time's sake, we'll, we'll kind of keep moving, but when we go back there into the book of Acts, when we were, when we were looking at that um, passage on the Ethiopian and Philip, that's the question at hand. He says, do, do you understand what you're reading? And the answer, he answers back with the question, how can I, unless some, some man guide me? How, how, how on earth could I, could I learn this stuff? So God has also put into place human teachers that can also share some information. It's an incredible thing that he actually, that he applies. And that's really why we're here at this conference, right? So we, we, we get together, God's word is the authority, and yet man after man is going to step up behind this pulpit and share some information, some, some things that they've learned. There's no one in this room that can't learn something from somebody this week that, that's going to have maybe a little bit of light on some information or maybe a, a new take on some verses or something like that. Again, so there's, a, there's an intimacy involved with both God himself as a teacher. God has a teaching ministry. And then there's also, there's also human um, teachers that are involved with that. Let's go to 2 Timothy Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. So you know it's really it's really quite an honor that that again God would God would put something like that into place and it's an, it's a tremendous responsibility or stewardship if you will again that a man might um, be able to teach some spiritual things out of this book in Second Timothy chapter two. Verse 7, 
Paul writes, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So there you see that little connection with, with both the human, the human teacher and, and the divine all in one little passage. Paul says, consider what I say, but who's the one that's given the understanding? God's the one that's, that's given, given the understanding ultimately. So, again, they, they, there's, a, there's a connection where the, the, the teachers have to be both, again, God himself and, um, and um, a man. Now, the, the next thing that we have to have or prerequisite that we have to have in place is you've got to study the book. Again, the book is not going to make any sense to you if you, if you don't. Uh, pick it up at some point if we don't if we don't get our nose in the book right that's the way that the thing works so again not to be preachy but again what, what we have to understand is at some point you've got to put down the ipad you got to put down the remote control you got to turn off the game you got to put down the phone or whatever it is you're doing you got to stop working and you got to open up the book god's not going to just all of a sudden wake up the next morning and all of a sudden you have tremendous understanding about the old testament not going to happen not going to happen. You have to, you have to roll up your sleeves and you have to study the thing. That's the thing that we don't always like is the, is that element of study. Loretta Lynn sang a song. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants, everybody wants the truth, but nobody wants to study. So that's the, that's the thing is you gotta, you gotta study the thing out if it's going to make sense, but you got to study the word God's way. You have to study the word rightly divided. You can study till you are blue in the face. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, it is not going to make sense. Period. That is a dying truth. Again, we say that over and over and over and over at these messages, um, but it is just a dying truth. If you do not rightly divide the word of truth, this is going to be a book of nonsense. Again, you can, you can think that you can throw out right division and, and study it um, a different way, the book is not going to make any sense. And that, that, again, that, that's just, just going to be a dying truth. So what we're, what we're going to do here is we're going to just kind of have some fun. Um, it's, a, it's a Monday morning, so if it's a Monday morning and you're not working, usually you should be home watching a game show. So what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take man's wisdom and we're going to kind of match it up against some things that the Bible has to say. And, and we're going to see what, what the natural man who removes those elements of faith, right division, study, and just, again, is going to base their understanding of the scriptures on their own intellect and what the, what the end result of that thing is, is going to be. So let's go to the book of Colossians real quick. Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. So as we... As we get into our Bible Jeopardy, our reigning champion is Bible truth. Bible truth has never been defeated. And yet there's going to be a, a new challenger coming up week after week. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. So we'll read about some of these challengers. Paul warns in the book of Colossians, he says in, in uh Chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let's go to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. So again, he gives this warning that an opponent of philosophy is going to come along and try to challenge the written word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 Verse 20, Paul says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. That would, that would really be another good word for philosophy, right? Another, another good way to describe something like that. Profane and vain babblings in opposition of science falsely so-called. So we're not talking about accurate science where there's nothing wrong with science there's something wrong with false science something that professes itself to be truth but is in fact not truth and there's going to be again these uh, these opponents that are going to come along so as we're as we're playing bible jeopardy really what the what the general theme here is again um is man's wisdom versus the bible so our first contestant representing the world of science is we'll, we'll, uh, one, of, one of our first challengers 
He is an American astronomer, a cosmologist, an astrophysicist, best known for his contributions to the scientific research on extraterrestrial life. His, his name is Carl Sagan, was Carl Sagan. And um, so, again, what Carl Sagan is going to do is he's going to take creation for 100 points. <laughs> so what, 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 what he, Carl Sagan is going to come up with when it comes to the issue of creation is he's going to say, we'll read the whole quote, the idea that God is an oversized white male, certainly no, nothing about that in here, with a flowing beard who sits in the sky and tallies the fall of every sparrow is ludicrous. But if by God one means a set of physical laws that govern the universe, then clearly there is such a God. So the conclusion that he comes up with is, is, is that, that if there is a God, then that God is the physical laws that govern the universe. So the answer is, what's the Bible's response? What saith the scriptures? Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You know, you know and as, as, as much as we laugh, Carl Sagan's not laughing in eternity. Gird up, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I'll demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. That mouth is shut. Right? Okay. So again, again, um, science is not doing too well at this point. So our next contestant representing the world of science man's wisdom is... Um, a man who is an evolutionary biologist, he is very much alive. An author contends that a supernatural creator almost certainly does not exist and that religious faith is a delusion. His name is Richard Dawkins. Now, Richard Dawkins is going to take Jesus and the Old Testament ethics for 100 points. So... Dawkins is going to try to reconcile the teachings of Jesus with Old Testament ethics and the conclusion that he comes up with are Jesus was not content to de derive his ethics from the scriptures of his upbringing. He explicitly departed from them. What saith the scriptures? Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill you could never come up with that conclusion if you had the most basic understanding of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. To say that the teachings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are somehow rejecting the ethics of his upbringing. Again, there's the only way that you could come up with a conclusion like that is if you had almost zero knowledge of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and yet you go around the world and the country um, debating this, this information. Now, so again, science isn't, isn't doing too well. So our next, our next contestant is going to represent the world of philosophy. This man was the president of the American Philosophical Society. He founded the University of Virginia. He was the principal author of the Declaration of Independence. He's best known as the third president of the United States, a man who needs no further introduction, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson had kind of an unusual idea about the Bible. He was a, he was a spiritual guy in his, own, in his own way, but he thought a lot of the Bible was, was really ridiculous. It was ludicrous, unbelievable, but he, thought, he liked the teachings of Jesus. They like that, don't they? They like, they like the way that Jesus teaches. They just don't like the rest of the scriptures. So what, what Jefferson did while he was in the Oval Office, while he was in Washington, is he, he, he took a Bible and, uh, and he made a scrapbook and he, and he took out some scissors or a pen knife, and he cut out the parts of the Bible that he didn't like. And then he took the parts, the teachings of Jesus that he did like, and he basically what he did is he added to the Bible. And he, and he made his own Bible that he kept by his bedstand and would read every night. But he, again, he got rid of the parts that that he didn't like. But, but Jefferson was too busy while he was running the affairs of the country and, and, and it became a big hassle. So he put the project on hold for a little while and he didn't really complete the project until he had retired and, um, 
So, so again, he ended up coming up with his own thing. Now, if that's a ridiculous thing to you or if that just turns your stomach, think about this for a second. Every member of Congress and the Senate today in 2016 receives a copy of the Jefferson Bible when they take office. So, again, it's very much um, alive and well. Basically, if you, if you know that story back in Jeremiah, you think about that, that issue of Jehudi. He takes that pen knife, cuts it out, and just throws it in the fire. Jefferson... Again, did the same thing now. So not no big surprise, Jefferson thought there, there was a bunch of contradictions in the Bible. So what he's going to do, representing the world of philosophy, is he's going to take Jesus and Paul, reconciling the four Gospels and Paul's epistles, because that's the challenge, and seeing if they, they make any sense with each other. Paul's epistles are going to be the things that are going to end up in the fire in this situation. Jefferson's conclusion is that Paul was the first corrupter of the doctrines of Jesus. Now, what saith the scriptures? Paul says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The words that Paul is preaching are the words of Jesus, and yet those were verses that somehow Thomas Jefferson had missed. Now, the next one representing the world of philosophy is a man named Albert Schweitzer. Now, you understand not all of these guys, we got a couple of these scientists, Carl Sagan, Dawkins, and a and hundred or a thousand more. They're going to reject just the scriptures as a whole. Not, not all of them are going to, are going to do that. They're going to come up with their own conclusions. So sometimes they'll, they'll take the Bible, they, they like parts of the Bible, but they only like the parts of the Bible that make sense to them. So Albert Schweitzer is going to really, he's, well, all, he's, all he's doing, again, out, let's, let's give him a, a proper introduction as, as we gave the other ones. He's a French theologian, a musician, a philosopher, a physician. He was a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. He's going to really take the same category as, as um, Jefferson's doing. He's trying to reconcile Jesus and, and the teachings of Paul. He must have got his ideas from Jefferson. So the conclusion that he says is, where possible, Paul avoids quoting the teachings of Jesus. In fact, even mentioning it, if we had to rely on Paul, we should not know that Jesus taught in parables, had delivered the Sermon on the Mount, had taught his disciples the Our Father, even where they are specially relevant, Paul passes over the words of the Lord. As if, again, Paul's message is kind of a second-rate message. The Bible's response to this is, Paul writes, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So, really, the only way that somebody could come up with a conclusion like that is again, just from a lack of knowledge of the scriptures. They, just, they didn't read the verses to come up with, to come up with that kind of, kind of conclusion. So what is the, the, the solution? What is, what is the answer to this thing? Now, um, again, we just, we just read that passage there in 2 Timothy. He says, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. So in, in this message, really the way that, that this has been described, and it's an actual act, accurate description, dispensational Bible study is the only path of true understanding and enjoying the Bible and making it relevant. Period. Period. Dispensational Bible study is the only path of truly understanding and enjoying the Bible and making it relevant. To most, the Bible is a mystery, but they don't know the mystery. Can the Bible make sense today if you know a secret? Understanding that, understanding that secret. So what, does the Bible make sense to, uh, again, the question is, is, a, is a yes or no answer. Can the Bible make sense to a lost person? Not so much. It's going to become a book of nonsense, a book of confusion, a book of babble, a book of foolishness. Now, I had... I had in, in our little in our little church, I had a woman who was um, we, we really started off as a the church started off as a, under the Baptist denomination, Independent Baptist, and I had a woman in the church that um, she had really been a, a churchgoer her whole life, a Bible student her whole life, and and I'll tell you right now, her Bible was just as marked up as anybody in this room. 
her, her, the pages in her Bible are just as dog-eared, and yet nobody had ever come along to her and taught her God's word rightly divided. So I was able to teach in this, given an opportunity in this little ministry for a couple years. And after about two years, she, she never gave me any feedback, ever. One night on a Wednesday night, I was there a little bit early, and she was as well kind of waiting for the crowd, or, or the lack of a crowd, to get there. And, <laughs> and she says to me, you know, i got to tell you, I have always loved my Bible. I've, I've always loved going to church and studying the Bible, but once I've learned how, how it lays out, now it makes so much sense. Now that, now that you've taught me how to, what do you call it, rightly divide. Now that you've taught me how to rightly divide, now I just love it. And, and now what I want to do is, now that I know how the Bible works, I want to get into Paul's epistles, and I want to study Paul. It was all I could do to jump out of my seat and go give her a hug. And, and um, you know, but she wasn't complimenting me. She was just saying that as, let's start studying Paul. Now that, now that we've gotten to this point, she was, she was excited about the information. So we'll, ask, we'll answer that question real quickly. Again, is, is there's, a, there's a caveat, um, can the Bible make sense today? Before, before you know, I, I comment on that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a little bit, is... Um, my little son, f- five years old, almost six, he was, he was learning to read a little bit this year, and, he's, and he's, my wife is teaching him how to read, and he's reading in both English and Spanish. And, you know, I hear him uh, uh, not too long ago, and he's, uh, he's up in the living room, and he's jumping around, and he's going, I can read, 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 I can read. And I tell you what, the, the joy that he had was if it was Christmas and his birthday, and I just gave him a big bowl of sugar, <laughs> all wrapped in one, just the excitement that he could look on a page and understand what was on that page, that that page would actually make sense to him. And that's the same freedom. When you understand God's word rightly divided, you go, I can, I can make sense out of this book. And, and, and there, are, there are those that they come to right division, and, and some of us have been there, right? You just want to click your heels. It's, it's such an exciting process. And, um, and, and understanding some of the way that these things um, make sense. Now, like I said, we'll just kind of add really the, the topic of the title of the topic um, this morning to add to it was really, can the Bible make sense today? So, you know, the, the question, I'm not really sure what that means, but the idea is, you know, did, did, does the Bible make more sense today than it did 50 years ago? And what I'll say or what I'll submit to that is this, is the Bible makes no more or less sense today than it did 3,000 years ago. God's Word doesn't make any less sense today than it's going to make 3,000 years from now. God's Word is God's Word is God's Word. God's Word can make sense in any age, in any dispensation, if you study the thing the right way. Now, the reason why the Bible does not make sense to too many men, unfortunately, today, is because they don't want it to. They, they don't want the book to make sense. So they, they approach, when we, when we mention some of these scientists or philosophers, they approach the book with the attitude of defeating the book, attacking the book, criticizing the book, being skeptics of the book. The book is never, ever, ever going to make any sense to them. And they're the ones that are going to wrestle around in their own mind because they, they approach it from that attitude. Mark Twain says, it ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. <laughs> that witness, he, he understood parts of it. And those are, those are, the, parts, those are the parts that are ultimately um, going to bother him. So, so again, can the Bible make sense today? Absolutely, the Bible can make sense. But you've got to have, you gotta have four things in place. Again, not, not, not an overly deep um, thing. It's, this is really, this is really a simple thing, but yet this is well, as simple as this is to the people in this room. This is milk that most of Christendom is choking on. So while, you know, while we look at this as, as something that we might, you know, teach our kids when we do teach our kids, this is not something that's so obvious so when we, you know, we take those, those four men and we just use them as an example. So we take um, someone like Carl Sagan or Richard Dawkins or Thomas Jefferson. Um, 
And, you know, in those guys, if I just take those four men, sometimes, sometimes we get to this idea also where we think, well, everybody's an idiot. Oh, these guys are idiots. Thomas Jefferson was not an idiot. Let's, let's establish that. You don't write the Declaration of Independence and are an idiot. You don't found the University of Virginia and you're an idiot. Richard Dawkins is not an idiot. So we want to understand who these, who these guys are. Those, those four guys, we just use, all we're using that is a little sample of the wisdom of the world. That's all we're talking about here. Um, you take those four guys, they're going to have more intellect than this whole hotel put, put together. Uh, you know, we, we try to play trivial pursuit with them and see what the results are. Um, and yet they don't have faith. They refuse to be taught. They refuse to study the word with an open heart attitude, and they certainly don't know the first thing about right division. So at the end of the day, the thing is going to end up um, just being in, in a world of confusion. So what I'll do is we'll close out with this. Is really what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll twist the question just a little bit and what, or the statement. What I'll say is this, and we'll close with this, is I'm going to say that the world itself doesn't make any sense without an understanding of God's word rightly divided. Again, bold statement, I'll say it again. The world itself does not make any sense without an understanding of God's word rightly divided. Praise God again that we're here. Um, and we'll close out with this. Is, um, this, is a great, this is a school um, conference. It's a Bible conference. It's a family conference. But first and foremost, it is a school conference. If you are in the school, we encourage you to continue. Um, keep on keeping on, plugging through the school. And um, if you have a loved one that's in the school, encourage them to go through the classes. Encourage them to, to, um, to keep plugging on. And um, Grace School of the Bible changes lives. And really, that's what, that's what this is about. So we just want to, again, um, take a minute to, again, just to encourage one another. Th Lord God, we thank you for this morning. Um, we thank you for the men that are here and um, that have, have traveled here to teach us about um, your word and, and the things that they've learned and the things that they've gleaned. And again, just that we might be, that they might be helpers of our joy and we might just be able to, to just, again, get those blessings and the fruit from some of the years of study that they've had. And uh, we thank you for this conference and we thank you for the ministry that is Grace School of the Bible. And it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.